As you perhaps know, Switzerland has a quite delicate position in uh, Europe, and this is related to, also to the research field. So we are very interested to know what's going on in uh, the European uh, research programs, uh, especially in, from a point of view of the research data. And I thank very much Daniel Spichtinger to be present today and to talk about this topic. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, for the, the organizers for inviting me. Um, I think it's a very timely topic. So I used to, uh, when I started working on open access, it was very much open access to publications. So um, we were designing also our policy on open access to publications for Horizon 2020. Um, but we see that the whole issue of uh, data, open access to data, is really the new frontier, which is being uh, discussed, controversially discussed. So I think some of the, the issues that were raised already in the previous presentations, uh, it's also something you know, that, that, that we hear a lot uh, in the interactions that we have with our different stakeholders. So I, what I want to do is give a bit of an overview of what is our policy rationale for dealing with open access in general on the European level, then telling you a bit more on, on this pilot that we are doing. So actually, I think it's quite complementary to the presentations you may have seen previously, because I will go more into detail um, from our own funding activities and this pilot that we are having, what it looks like, what are the requirements, and uh, well, yeah, how is it set up? And then giving you a very brief implementation update. I mean, nearly no Horizon 2020 projects have started yet, so it's kind of difficult to talk about implementation, but we have some in preliminary figures from the proposal phase. So I'll talk a bit about that, and I'll finish off with the, the wider conclusions and context. Um, I'm also quite happy that this... this uh, event here is talking about open research data. That's one of the things that I encounter quite a lot is that people talk about data, but they talk about you know, different concepts. So some people talk about the Facebook data, and this, of course, uh, different issues that what we have with research data. Um, so why are we dealing with this on the European level? Well, our objective is that, you know, as the Commission, we want to optimize the impact of the research that we are funding, ultimately with the taxpayers' money. So from our own research, that's one thing, the framework programs, FP7 and now Horizon 2020, as well as uh, coordinate activities with the member states. And one way to optimize the impact of publicly funded research is open access. Not the only way, but it's one way. So we are saying, of course, we are seeing, you know, potential benefits for science, and some of those have been discussed by the previous speakers. But we also say potential for growth, and this is of course also the context that uh, we are in. The economic crisis is not over, so its um, economic perspectives are something that I think are also very much on our mind, and also the mind of our new Commission President, if you read uh, the pro program of Jean-Claude Juncker. So that's a bit the bigger context. Um, as well as, of course, saying, you know, since it's ultimately taxpayer money we are using, the results should also be available to the taxpayers. Now, some people will say, well, you know, individual citizens very often, they do not understand the details of my biomedical research, for instance. Uh, there may be other organizations, for instance, NGOs, who may be very much interested in the research that is going on, thinking, for instance, about climate change. There may also be small and medium-sized enterprises who may be very much interested. Um, so we are actually, as the European Commission, we are wearing different hats in a way. Um, we are, of course, a policy maker, so we make policy um, European legislation, um, and uh, we coordinate the member states. But in this case, we are also a funding agency, so we set the rules for our own program. Horizon 2020, as well as being a capacity builder. So we are also funding projects that support our policy 
for instance, infrastructure, but not limited to infrastructure. I'll say a bit about that later on. Um, if you want to know what our policy is, and you, know, you want to look up a bit further to what I'm saying in this PowerPoint, there are three documents that set out our policy. They were all launched at the same time. The first one is um, the communication on the European research area, which is much bigger than just open access. It's basically coordinating European researchers. The idea of having something like a single market for research and cross-cutting issues that are being discussed in this context, one of them being open access. And then, then more, two more detailed documents, the communication on uh, better access to scientific information, and the recommendation to the member states, which go into more detail on open access related issues, both publications, data, preservation, and so on. Um, the recommendation is, of course, a soft law instrument, as it's a recommendation. So uh, if the member states do not do what we recommend, we cannot take them to court. But we think we're making some good recommendations, so we are working with them on implementing those. This uh, is, well, in a few days, my former commissioner, uh, Gegen Quinn. So she was working on this file, I would say, together with uh, Vice President Cruz, who has already been mentioned. My commissioner was the commissioner for research. Um, Vice President Cruz was responsible for the digital agenda. So open access is very much a file that has been basically set out by those two uh, ladies and the two departments that are responsible for it, the Director General for Research, so it's kind of the research ministry if you want, uh, or equivalent, and the CONNECT, the Digital Affairs Ministry. So my commissioners and both commissioners were quite supportive of this whole idea of making research results open. So you have here, I think, one of her last statements on the matter, which was uh, at the ESOF, um, the Euroscience Open Forum this year, earlier this year. So how have we implemented open access in Horizon 2020? This is the quote from the regulation. So this is th what we have uh, proposed and where both the Parliament, uh, European Parliament and the Council have worked on, adapted and in the end passed. Um, so in the regulation we are saying we, are, we will ensure open access to publications. So Horizon 2020 has open access to publications, scientific peer-reviewed publication as an underlying principle. Um, and we will promote open access to data. And this promotion of open access to data is basically our basis for running a pilot scheme on that. Uh, so for publications, I will not go into the detail, otherwise it would take too long, but if you're interested, we can also discuss this uh, in the breaks. So if you, you, know, you feel like looking into the legal aspects a bit more in detail, here are the documents starting from the most general. So this is our legal basis, the regulation establishing Horizon 2020, all down to the guidelines. So the guidelines are probably those that are more practical. So if you're submitting a project, you would want to look at the guidelines. Um, when we set out this pilot, you know, some people said, well, you know, it's kind of a complicated thing that you're doing. So I thought, well, let's uh, structure it according to these three key questions. And that's what I'm going to talk about for the rest of my presentation, mostly. So the questions of which thematic areas of Horizon 2020 are covered by this pilot. What kind of data are we looking at? Are we looking at, you know, raw data or other kinds of data? and what are the implications for data management. Um, so we said, and this was developed together with the colleagues in the DG Connect, that this idea of having a pilot to your research data would apply in specific areas of Horizon 2020. So on the most general level, um, Horizon 2020 is structured into three pillars the um, excellent science pillar, the leadership in industrial technology pillar, and the societal challenges pillar. And parts of that pillar are all represented in the areas that are covered by the pilot. You will see that some areas are completely covered, like future and emerging technologies, and in others there are also only parts. For instance, in secure, clean, and efficient energy, only the part on smart cities and communities is for the moment included. So in these areas, if you apply for a project, you would be 
by default in the pilot. If you're not in those, you are not. But then we said, well, maybe as a researcher, you also, you know, you're not submitting in these areas, you're maybe in agriculture, but you think it's a good idea. I want to share my data. And then uh, we should not be too restrictive and say, yes, but you are not in here, you cannot do it. So in all the other areas, of course, if as a researcher you want to participate, you can always participate on a voluntary basis, which we call an opt-in. So if you're not here, you still want to do it, you can join voluntarily. At the same time, and I think this has been raised uh, previously, we also see that there are good reasons uh, for not making your data open. So if you are part of this pilot because you have, you know, are in the core areas, um, you, you, we always recognize that there are reasons why you will not make data open. You will either opt out completely out of the pilot or you will restrict specific data sets. The first one, well, is the most obvious and easy if you don't generate any data. So we also funding some support actions, organizing a conference, for instance, you have no data there that is relevant. Or you have conflict uh, with your obligation to protect the results. So, you know, you're developing a product, you are protecting the IPR, well, you don't make that data open. You have uh, conflicts with confidentiality obligations or national security obligations. So I have to say so far I have not really encountered this, but maybe you think you're, you have a realistic view that your research could be turned into a weapon. Then, of course, we don't want you to make this openly available. Or you have um, conflicts with privacy and protection of personal data. Of course, for instance, in medical research, you don't put non-anonymized data out there. So those were the conflicts that we could think of last year when we designed this pilot, but we said, well, maybe there may be others that we haven't thought of yet. So there's also the last um, point, which say, well, if making the data open really goes against the main aim of your project, and if you can justify that, then you can also not participate in that. Um, then the second question, what kind of data are we talking about? First of all, we said, let's focus on the data that is needed to validate the results presented in a scientific publication. So you have a, a scientific publication, and we are focusing on the data underlying that publication for two reasons. First of all, because we hope that this is data you have cleaned and treated as a researcher, since you base your publication on that. And secondly, because we are seeing there are different studies in different scientific fields that indeed by looking at um, a publication in, in uh, I would say, shockingly often, you cannot actually reproduce the results of the experiment because the publication as such does not go into sufficient detail. So you actually need the underlying data to replicate the results. Um, so those are the types of data. Then, you know, what are beneficiaries uh, required to do? Well, first of all, you deposit the data in a repository of your choice. So we are not saying you have to put it in this and that place. We feel that researchers hopefully know best where the data will be looked at and analyzed. We are also, the colleagues in Connect are also um, funding the Synodo repository. So very happy to see that the colleagues from CERN are here and are also presenting Synodo. So Synodo is always uh, a possibility to deposit data if you know you think, well, I don't really know where, where to put it in my field. There is no repository that I can use. Then, of course, Synodo offers you the possibility to do that. And thirdly, um, at least our, our beneficiaries will be required to put, provide information about the tools and instruments that are needed to access that data. So for instance, you may have software, specific software that you need, which is not available you know, on the market or for free. So then you have to provide information about what you actually need to, to access that data. We say where possible, of course, is best if you provide these tools as well. But this is not something where we have, a, you know, we are forcing researchers to do that because it may not be possible. Um, a little bit more about, you know, it's the third question, data management. Um, we say that data management plans, so-called DMPs, are mandatory for all projects that participate in that pilot, optional for others. 
So we said, you know, it's actually, I think, it's quite a good tool, a data management plan, to make you, as a researcher, think about what you do with your data. Maybe you already do that, but in many cases, the impression is it's not always um, as it should be. So a DMP is not only making a data open, it's basically answering some, structuring your thoughts, how will you curate your data, how will you collect it, what will you make open and what will you not make open. Um, you're not required to submit such a data management plan when you submit the proposal. So this is something that's a bit different, for instance, in the States. They also have this uh, concept of data management plan or data stewardship plans. And in some funders in the States, they require the submission of such a plan as part of the evaluation. So this is, I have to stress this because sometimes this comes up. This is certainly not the case for Horizon 2020. So whether you participate in our pilot or not, does not at the moment, um, is not a criteria for how you're being evaluated. As in Horizon 2020, normally you are being evaluated on three criteria, um, the excellence of your research, the impact of your research, and the implementation. So the DMP is not part of that, implement, that, of that evaluation. What we do say is that, well, you, about a paragraph or so within the impact criteria on how generally you want to handle data management. So again, this is not necessarily making things open, but writing a paragraph, how will you manage your data so that the evaluators see, well, I thought about data management as such. And we also said, well, okay, then a DMP has to be done after that, after the evaluation, after your project is approved. Because otherwise you have a lot of work in preparing such a data management plan and maybe your project will not go through. So we are saying we are asking for that once your project has been approved within the first six months. And um, at the moment we are also quite flexible on how this DMP looks like. So we are not providing you with a 200 page template to fill in. We basically want you to uh, answer those four questions uh, in, a, in a structured way. Um, so that we are also um, incentivizing the, the process on how you will deal with your data. As I've said in the beginning, for us, we see this uh, research data, opening up of research data as, as a new frontier. And uh, I would say we feel that we have been both ambitious and pragmatic in the design of the pilot. So we wanted to go an extra step from FP7, the previous framework program, where we didn't really have anything on open access to data. And so we're starting with the pilot. Um, we are having flexible opt-ins, but also flexible opt-outs. Um, we will, of course, have to talk a bit about the uptake and the experiences of the pilot. So we will monitor on what are the opt-outs, what are the opt-ins in different areas. Um, but we would encourage you to apply for the pilot, even if you are not covered in the areas, since I think we have tried to demonstrate here it's basically an opportunity, it's not a threat. If you develop data in your project and you find out, oh, I don't want to make this open, it's simply something you mention in your data management plan, which by the way should also be updated. So of course in the beginning of the project you will not know the details of the data you will generate two years on. So the idea is that you have a first version within the first six months of your project and then you update the, the plan as your project develops. So this is certainly a possibility for you, basically as a researcher, to participate in the further development of this policy area. Um, this is maybe a bit too detailed, so at the moment if you apply for a project, you will see forms like that, where we are asking on the, on the left, um, if, you, if you are in the core areas and you, do, you want to not participate, why? And on the right, if you are not in the core areas but you want to participate voluntarily, also why. So this is how it's at the moment implemented because all the application is nowadays, of course, electronic. Um, so I promised you a little bit of, a, of an update of where we stand with this. As I've said, Horizon 2020 projects haven't really started yet, but of course we have proposals. So we looked at um, proposals that were submitted. Uh, we have data for 3,054 proposals, so these are not funded projects, just proposals. But we see that in the core areas, which I showed you before, these are per default in, 
we have an average opt-out rate from 24.2%. Uh, so this is actually, to me, um, um, quite a good uh, first result, as it shows that you know, there are not 80% of people saying, I don't want to do this. Of course, it uh, depends very much which area you are in, but generally, they are in the 20s, the opt-out ranges. Uh, and for the voluntary opt-in, so for those who are not covered by the pilot, but they have the opportunity if they want to, we see 27.2% uh, of proposers actually saying, yes, I want to do this. And here we see an even bigger um, variation among the different areas, so from 9% to up to 50%. Um, so we can say it's early days, you know, uh, it's, uh, we are starting with this, but I think the first you know, the first results from the proposals are okay, are encouraging, um, since we have below 30% opt-out ranges. Of course, I think what we need to do now, what we are actually doing at the moment, is following this up um, in the full life cycle of the projects, so during and after as well. Um, and this is now we are more or less in the phase where the grants are being signed, so now it's getting official, so we'll have to monitor whether the initial quite good uptake is actually then also reflected in the, the signed grants. Uh, a few words also on coordination and support actions. Um, as I've said before, we are also uh, supporting, uh, giving money for open access related actions. Of course, there is uh, the last one I mentioned, Open Air, Open Air Plus, which is really uh, a project uh, funded by the colleagues in the DG Connect. It's very well known, which has help desks and also uh, operates uh, together with CERN Synodal Repository. Um, so open air, I can very much recommend if you have on your national level, you have questions about open access, they have help desks in each country, which is something that uh, on the European level, it's two people working on this, so it's, we cannot answer all the questions an individual scientist may have. But there are also other support actions we are funding. For instance, there's um, a training project which is called FOSTER. So they are tasked with providing training on what is open access and how does it work. Um, and we are just finishing with a project which I find was quite interesting, which was called Recode. So they were looking at barriers and opportunities for open access to research data and they were are formulating uh, at the moment their recommendations. Both technical, legal, ethical, um, issues are addressed. Uh, from my side is, by the way, uh, you can circulate the slides and if you circulate the slides you can click on the links and it will give you, get you to the project website. We also looked at, we also funded um, an independent study to look at how has open access developed globally, um, both publications and data. Um, most of the results were focusing on publications but they also did a little bit on data. Um, and of course, maybe not uh, surprising, the outcome was that for the moment there are fewer funding bodies uh, that have policies for scientific data, but that this area is um, an area of fast growth, so it's really developing uh, rapidly. So I just put one of the slides here, what they, at the moment, based on the funding bodies that are listed in this um, website database raw map. So you can see that the fact 38% uh, at the moment they say nothing about it. Um, there are actually 29% who have a mandate for open access data archiving. 10% say, well, we encourage it. 23% are requirement. Um, then maybe to finish off, new developments. So of course, I think it's not something we can see in isolation. Uh, it's open access to research data or basically research data as such, is part of the changing scientific system. So the fact that we don't do science the same way we did it in the 1970s based on inter alia, the IT revolution. So the fact that we have all this massive amount of data available nowadays on the internet. Um, also globalization, globalization of research, how different researchers cooperate. Um, so at the moment, we are, uh, my colleagues are looking at all these factors in the changing scientific system, which they call science 2.0, or in fact, nowadays, we're tending to call it open science. Um, so that includes also alternative metrics, uh, research, research career evaluation practices, 
and publishing activities. So basically we are saying the scientific system is changing in a way that is not just one aspect, it's not just that as a researcher I have a blog and that's the great news, no, it's really a, a more general change in the way all of these uh, production cycle is affected from analysis to publication to review and then again conceptualization and data gathering and there are some examples here on how this is done. At the moment, so we just finished a consultation on these more bigger aspects of uh, how the scientific system is changing and uh, the colleagues are working at the moment on uh, making the results of that consultation public. So we see it very much as one aspect of, as I've said, changing scientific system, but we also see it as a means to improve knowledge circulation and um, also um, economic aspects, providing value for the taxpayers' money. And we think well, we have been, we've tried to find the balance between, on the one hand, being pragmatic, not adding an additional burden to researchers, but doing something that is ambitious and that will kickstart the process, because of course, we also got the criticism, yes, but the infrastructure you know, may not be there. But if you wait until the infrastructure is perfect before you do anything, you will never do anything. Because, of course, it's a cycle that uh, feeds into each other. Um, we also, of course, offer support. So I've mentioned some of the, the, um, the projects that we are already funding. There are also other um, projects uh, in the currently open calls in e-infrastructure, as well as we have a project on um, new ways of doing uh, disseminating research. So this is more a research project into the Science 2.0 aspects, which is open um, next year. So our general idea is that open access uh, should be done in a way that's on the one hand effective, but also affordable, competitive, and sustainable for the researchers, but also for the businesses. Um, so the last slide, um, there are our contacts. Um, we have a functional email box but of course you're very welcome also to write me a personal email. Um, and then some links, so some people who have experience with our website from the commission, they say, well, it's not always very easy to find what you're looking for. So we have uh, here the direct links uh, to our open access website, but also to a collection of resources that our library has provided. And if you want to know more about the science metric study, we have a link to their preliminary results, and in fact, they just published the final version of their results, but that's at the moment just on their own website. If you are planning to apply for Horizon 2020 project, you have the two guidance documents, and those really go into the details of um, what I've described here. Uh, finally, my former colleague started our Twitter account, which I'm trying to update occasionally, so I've been Last week, a bit uh, lazy, I have to say, for Open Access Week, but I will try to, uh, well, I, we usually publish occasionally uh, important information that we come across, also when we do something. So feel free to follow us if you like. Um, and on that note, uh, I think I'm about to finish, and if we have time for questions, do we have time for questions? Yes? Okay, very good, thank you. Thank you very much for this very precise, concrete presentation. Uh, there are some questions. Yes, um, indeed, sharing the, the, info, uh, the information in general, it's uh, valuable and uh, improve competitiveness and so on. But I was wondering if nobody at the European Union level thinks that you share also data with competitors, because somehow European Union, it, expected to promote European Union. Hmm. So I wonder, nobody complains about this, or how it is? Yeah. No, of course, this is, uh, this is an issue, competitiveness, you know, what are our competitors doing? So that's, of course, something that also in this presentation I had to cut a little bit because I used to have more on the international aspects, both for open access to publications and for open access to data. And of course, this is not something that we in Europe can claim to have invented. If you look, for instance, at uh, the mandates for US-funded research, those in, in many cases go beyond what we have in Europe. If you look at NIH data, for instance, I mean, that is available uh, open access. But of course, the competitiveness aspect is also part of our pilot because we are saying very clearly, if you are planning to develop a product and you, know, you want to protect your IPR, of course, you don't make that data open. 
That is very clear. Hello. Thank, thank you for this very precise and um, presentation. I have a question more related to the open access related to scientific publication. How do you merge that with the open, ac open access data? What, what are you doing there? And uh, maybe s some thoughts about uh, fundings, fin uh, hmm? problems, or so on. Thanks. Okay, so that's another thing that I kind of cut from my presentation because I was asked to focus on data. But very briefly, um, as I've said, it will become an obligation if you have a grant from uh, Horizon 2020 to publish in open access. But we leave it to the researcher what ways of open access publishing you want to, to do. So basically there is you know, the green route that you may have heard about. Basically, you publish in a normal journal, and at the same time, you put your publication in a repository, and after a certain embargo period, it becomes available for free, but in the repository. So that's one option to do. The other option is to go for the gold route, where you publish immediately, but then the publisher asks uh, for an author or article processing charge. And this author processing charge can be part of your eligible costs. So you have your project, you set away some pot of money to cover that. So both of these are, are possible. And we are now also starting a pilot action, which is quite limited since it's uh, another pilot, which is about publication costs in open access after the project have, has ended. Because this was a criticism that we say, well, your publication, you have it at the end, but you cannot pay the gold way because your grant is over. So we are setting up a separate fund as part of a larger EU project to, to uh, have a pilot action on funding that. So that's very briefly, that's what we are doing on the publication side. I, ha I have a question over here. Um, ah, okay. uh, so I'm excited about the uh, open data pilots and, and what will come of them, but I have a slightly more challenging question for you perhaps. Um, uh, so, we, so we have Zenodo, as you mentioned, as an option, uh, which is kind of a, a generic repository for smaller data sets. Uh, we have, increasingly, we have uh, libraries and institutions coming up with um, ways to deposit data sets in their institutional repositories. But um, a lot of researchers I talk to are much more interested in disciplinary repositories that um, where they know the data will be curated in the long term by subject experts and people who understand the data and there's user support available for people using the data. And I wonder um, if, uh, if you could say who, whose job do you think it is to fund those sorts of services? Well, for, for specific repositories and infrastructure, uh, the EU funds quite a bit uh, of those which are maybe not you know, primarily, or at least in their conception, they may not always have been dis designed as open access uh, infrastructures, but more and more they are becoming open access. For instance, uh, I put here GeoGeos, which is in the environmental sciences, is also actually larger than just uh, the European Union, or Elixir and the life sciences, which are, uh, is funded by the Commission and has then an open access uh, component, repository component. Whether we can fund an infrastructure for each area, I mean, that's, uh, that's another issue. I don't think we have at the moment a plan for each uh, scientific area to fund an infrastructure for open access, uh, but that's also something maybe we have to, to, to look into that's, uh, for the future. Um, yeah, that's more on the, on the infrastructural sides of things. Um, I think we consciously decided not to have a catch-all repository. So when we had the, when we were discussing on how to do this pilot, um, we were saying maybe we should have an EU-funded uh, repository. If you have a grant from the EU, you have to put it in a central repository. But then we said, well, okay, but maybe this would not be accepted in some areas because they have their established repositories. So this is why we decided not to go down the, the centralized route. Thank you. I, I was also thinking about the long-term sustainability of some of those 
disciplinary repositories which survive on short-term funding. Mm -hmm. Now, I take this on board. Uh, it's something I, I heard previously. So. So thank you very much again. Thank you. Uh,